Today's lesson will be on the relationship between elements using the periodic table. This is what it looks like. We see that there are numerals across the top of this raised group. These numerals are called groups. Obviously this is group one, group two, group three, group four, etc. In this little cutout section here, we call them the transition metals. So this section, we're not gonna worry about too much right now, but we need to just understand the groups. So as you can see, the majority of the periodic table consists of metals. And you can see probably about two thirds or more of the periodic table is metals. That could be one way of classifying elements by the fact that if they're on a certain place in the periodic table, they're called metals or maybe they're not. So that's just one way of sort of naming things based on the periodic table. Now, additionally, we can classify things by the state that they're in. Most metals at room temperature are solid with the exception of mercury. So barring mercury, metals are our major constituent of the periodic table that are solid at room temperature. So if we found lots of different elements and these elements were solid, we would probably think of them as metals. So this can be used to separate metals from non-metals because non-metals are often gases with the exception of sulfur and carbon as well as iodine. So iodine is crystal, sulfur is crystal, carbon can be crystal in diamond form, could be solid in graphite form. So what we're going to look at is basically, well, what are the general trends or in terms of general properties that we see element and its position on the periodic table? In general, elements on the left hand side are metals. They're solid at room temperature, great electrical conductors, great thermal conductors and malleable and ductile. And if I was to go and tell someone that elements on the left hand side of the periodic table are metals and they knew what a metal was, they could go to their periodic table and point out maybe magnesium and say, look, I don't know what this is exactly, but I could guess, because I know what a metal is, that it's probably a good electrical conductor and all of these other things. So you can see that because they know it's on the left, they instantly know its properties, okay? Because they know it's on the left. So that's one thing that we can sort of draw out. As we go from left to right, so from that way to this way, pointing at the non-metals, the metallic character of elements decreases. When we go from the left-hand side, with the exception of hydrogen, we notice that elements that, as we go this way, start to lose their metallic character. They look less like metals. Elements on this side are much less like metals than these guys. So as you go from left to right, elements start to stop looking like metals and begin looking like non-metals. And then there's this transitional period here, these elements, which are the semi-metals. And so they sort of bridge the gap between metals and non-metals. And as you move down the periodic table or down the groups, the metallic character of elements tends to increase. As you go this way and this way down, this bottom chemical will start to look more like a metal than this top one. And that's just because of the way the electrons are structured. That summarizes physical properties that we can see from the periodic table. For physical properties, there's not much we can sort of draw out from this because the periodic table doesn't tell us a lot about physical properties. But those are the general things we can draw out from the periodic table. So we looked at how the placement on the periodic table tells us some things about the physical properties of a particular chemical and, and what trends we can draw out by looking at the periodic table. Question 11. Identify whether each of the elements in the table would exist as a solid, liquid or gas at room temperature. So room temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. To determine the state of an element, what phase it's in, you need to look at the melting and boiling point. If this line indicates temperature, and this is a low temperature and this is a high temperature, if the temperature of the environment exceeds the boiling point, then that element will be a gas. If it's between the melting and boiling point, so if the temperature of the environment is, say, between both the melting and boiling point, it will be a liquid. And if the temperature is less than the melting point, it will be a solid. So in your freezer, your freezer will get down to negative 4 degrees Celsius and that temperature in the freezer is negative four. Water freezes at zero, as you know. So the temperature of the outside environment is less than the melting point of water, which is zero degrees. The water will exist as a solid, which is ice. And so that's how we applied that to this question. So as you can see, the first one, 25 degrees Celsius is a lot less than 1,490 degrees Celsius, so 1,490. So it's much less than the melting point. So you would expect that element A is a solid. Before I give you the answer here, I just look at where does 25 sit in relation to these numbers? Well, 25 is less than 58. It could be a liquid or it could be a solid, we don't know yet. But 25 degrees is definitely bigger than minus seven. So it sits between these two, which means that it's melted, but it hasn't boiled yet. So if it's melted and it hasn't boiled, it's a liquid because that's what a liquid is. It's between gas and solid. Liquid is an answer. Okay, and if we go through the next one, 25 is less than 114. So it's less than the melting point. So it's a solid. 
And here, 25 degrees is less than 357, but bigger than negative 39. It must be a liquid. And lastly, 25 degrees Celsius is much bigger than minus 196 degrees Celsius. So it's bigger than the boiling point. If it's bigger than this number, it's up here somewhere, we know it's a gas. And that's how we answer that question. Question 12. Which elements from the periodic table would exist as monatomic elements? So which one doesn't bond with anything? Okay, which one's the least reactive? When we look at the periodic table, the chemical properties that the periodic table tells us, we know that group eight is the group that doesn't react with anyone. They're the cool group. Everyone wants to be these guys. This group is the group that all of these other elements are aspiring to be like. They don't interact with any of the other chemicals. The noble gases exist as monatomic gases since they do not need to react with other compounds to achieve stability. So these guys are stable. They're what all of these guys here are aspiring to be like. Now, which elements from the periodic table are highly reactive metals? So from what we talked about, where do we find metals? Somewhere here. That doesn't help us too much, but it helps us a little bit. At least we know that it's not this section. Now, highly reactive? If I was to guess, I would say that if these are the very stable ones, if I go to the opposite end, I'll find the very reactive ones. And that kind of logic is actually correct because group one is the most reactive metal compounds. This is due to the fact that they only have one electron in their outer shell. And so they really just want to get rid of it and react with something. So that makes them very reactive. And again, we'll go through in ionic bonding what happens with each of these metals. Now, since it only needs to remove one electron, it will readily react with lots of different compounds. When I go through ionic bonding, that will become clear to you, okay? Which elements from the periodic table would have the following properties? Brittle, generally low density, and most of them exist as gases. If you were to guess, well, if you're not guess, sorry, you know this one. These properties are non-metal properties. So we'd be looking somewhere over this side, as well as hydrogen on the left. These are all, well, most of them exhibit these properties with the exception of maybe carbon. They're non-metals. And why is helium preferred to hydrogen for use in a balloon? So why do we like helium more than hydrogen? And it's not because it makes our voice really high. Where is helium? It's here. These guys we just mentioned are very stable and those guys over there are very reactive. So that might lead us onto the right path. So helium is a noble gas as highlighted and thus is very unreactive. Hydrogen, however, is a very reactive gas that reacts with oxygen to create water and a lot of heat. By storing the hydrogen in a balloon, there's potential explosion hazard. We generally see balloons at birthday parties. What is a key feature of a birthday party? A birthday cake, and the cake has candles on it. And if you've got something that's flammable near candles, that's obviously not a great move on your part. So helium is a much safer choice compared to hydrogen. So that concludes today's lesson on the periodic table and physical properties. We looked at how we can sort of map physical properties onto the periodic table. And we looked at what trends about physical properties do we notice as we move around the periodic table. So hopefully you've gotten an introduction to the periodic table and are interested in learning more about it because we'll definitely cover it as we go on in future lessons. So look forward to seeing you at our next lesson.